good morning, church. If you would, open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 4 as we continue in our study this summer through Genesis chapter 1 through 11. All summer long, we've been looking to establish at how the Word of God is the story of this world and looking to see the, that the stories that we see played out from creation. And in the first two chapters of Genesis, we see a God who is revealed we see a God who is good, and we see a God who has created the world in a good design of how things should function, of how we're to live in this world. And we looked at a number of different ways through which who God is and the way he's created, created the world informs our, our sexuality, informs our view of the sanctity of life, of how we are to relate to one another across the races that exist in the one human race. We looked at God's design for rest and for work, and for marriage. And then over the past two weeks, we've been exploring what went wrong. And as we looked at not only what is sin, two weeks ago, last week we looked at the consequences of sin and God's good design for redemption. And that there is one who would come, who would be the way, the truth, and the life, who would make a way back into the presence of God where we can find life. And this morning, as we turn from the story of the fall in chapter 3 to look at the story of Cain and Abel, we once again want to remember that it's not just a story about Cain and Abel. It's a story about the progression of sin in the world. It's the story about the world that we live in today. And what we're going to see this morning through the story of Cain and Abel is that there is only One solution that is sufficient to deal with the root disease in our lives and in the world today. And as we looked at in Genesis 1 and 2 and God's good design for things about how the lies of the culture have led us largely to depart from God's good design, we talked about a number of different ways that God's people can and should act in this world today in such a way to restrain the evil that exists. But if we really want to see the hope for the world to be rescued from the disaster that we find it in, what we're going to see in Genesis chapter 4 is that there is only one thing. There is only one solution that can rescue humanity from the disease that sin is. And so this morning as we look at the progression of sin, and the continuation of God's good design for redemption. We're going to look at four different things as we walk through the story of Cain and Abel. We're going to look at the necessity of faith, and and in particular, faith in something specific, because we're going to see that everyone lives by faith, but what's necessary is faith in the right thing. As we look at the necessity of faith, we're also going to look at the mercy of of a good God in the middle of a world that is progressing deeper and deeper and deeper into sin. And then we'll end with the greatest message of hope, which comes at the end of the story of Cain and Abel, that God is faithful to keep his promise for a deliverer. So let's pray, and then we'll dive in. Father, we are so grateful that you are a good God, that your mercy is more And that you have been faithful to keep your promise to raise up a deliverer, to rescue us from the power of Satan and the power of sin, and to bring us back to you, who is the source of all life. And so God, this morning, I pray that you would help us as we examine and proclaim the truth of your revelation in Genesis chapter 4, that we would not just see a story of Cain and Abel, but that we would see our story, that we would see the necessity of faith in our own lives, that we would see you showing up in mercy towards us in a world caught in sin, that we would understand how the progression of sin happens in this world and in our lives, and that we would then hold fast and respond to your provision of a deliverer. So would you guide us this morning in these things? And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. 
Well, as we look at at diving into chapter 4, there's a temptation for all of us to take chapter 4, the story of Cain and Abel, in isolation. And if you've ever read the story of Cain and Abel, um, you might find it to be somewhat confusing. And there's this thing about two different offerings that don't seem all to be that much different from each other, but yet God has regard and accepts one, but he rejects another. And it can be really hard to understand everything that is happening, everything that God is showing us through this chapter. And the reason is, is because we read it as an isolated story. And so as we start with our examination of Genesis chapter 4, we have to realize how strongly it is connected and is a direct outworking of what we just studied last week and looked at last week in Genesis chapter 3. And specifically, how Genesis chapter 4, the story of Cain and Abel, is the progression, is the next step of what is happening based on God's judgment to the serpent in chapter 3, verse 15, and God's judgment on the woman in chapter 3, verse 16. So let me read those and set the context for what we're about to look at so that we can fully understand what God is revealing to us through the story of Cain and Abel. And so back in Genesis chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, it says this, And I, God, will put enmity between you and the woman, And between your seed and her seed. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain, you will bring forth children. And so what we see in this, these two little verses is a few things. One, that Eve was promised a child. One who would come, who would destroy the serpent. The one who led her astray into sin. It was also promised that there would be conflict between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman, that through Eve and through the children that she would bear, there would be a perpetual conflict between them, that some would follow God and others would follow the ways of the evil one, and there would be perpetual conflict between them. We also see that Eve was promised multiplied pain in bringing forth children. What's important for us to understand and for you to understand is that this multiplied pain was not just related to physical pain. But the reason that it was multiplied is that it related to the emotional sorrow that would come upon Eve as she saw the conflict that would exist between her offspring, between her children, some who were seed of the serpent, following the way of the evil one, and some who would be those who follow God. The conflict that would exist to them would would cause her great sorrow. And then also in expectation of this, there would be a great expectation of hope. That a child would, that there would come from a child who would destroy the head of the serpent and also sorrow that would come from another child. And so we see that the language of chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, of bringing forth children, and the language of chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, of conceiving and bearing, shows the direct connection of these two stories. And so as we begin to read verse 1 and verse 2 of the story of Cain and Abel, there should be great expectation in us. What the author, what God expects us to be looking for as we turn to this story is the expectation of multiple offspring and the expectation of conflict that would come between these offspring. And then also the expectation that we would see God being faithful to his promise through one to raise up a child who would be a deliverer from people who were enslaved to the seed of the serpent. And so in Genesis chapter 4, as we pick it up there, it says this. Now the man, Adam, had relations with his wife, Eve. And she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I have gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. And what we see here immediately is Eve's faith. What we see right here in verse 1 is Eve's faith that God had indeed and would indeed provide a deliverer. Let me show you where that comes from. The literal, the word for word translation in the Hebrew of verse one, when when Eve says, I have gotten a man child with the help of the Lord would read this way. I have gotten a man, Yahweh. I have gotten a man, the Lord. And what she's saying is I have been given, she's expressing faith that God had now given her a child who would be a representative of God. Eve had faith that God would indeed provide a seed 
who would destroy the head of the serpent. Eve's great expectation that the firstborn, Cain, would be that promised seed who would be the deliverer. It is her expression of faith and hope in God. But then we see, as we should expect, that there's more than one seed. There's more than one offspring. And verse 2 says this, And again she gave birth to his brother, Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And so now the stage is set. We have two seeds. We have two offspring. One, it would be assumed, would be someone who follows God and through whom God would either directly or through his descendants raise up a deliverer. And the other, the one who would be opposed to God, who would be the seed of the serpent. But which one is which? Which one is which? And now each of the details of the story that comes forth will represent the opposing characteristics with regard to the theme that is already set up of the opposing seeds. We're going to start to immediately begin to identify which is the one who is going to be the seed of the serpent and which is the one who is going to be the one who follows God and what is the distinction to help determine which is which. And so we see it identified in verse 2 that Cain was a tiller of the ground and that Abel is a keeper of the flock. And so something already that we can see here that begins to identify who will be following Satan and who will be following God comes with what they are, are identified with in terms of their occupation. When it says that Cain is identified as a tiller of the ground, it is relating to what man is cursed to do post-fall. God cursed the ground in Genesis chapter 3 and said that from toil, man would bring forth fruit from it. And so Cain is identified with the curse. Abel is a keeper of the flocks. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 29 and 30, we see God give man the purpose to rule over all the animals of the earth. And so we begin to see that Abel is identified with the condition of man pre-fall, and Cain is identified with the condition of man post-fall. And so we are beginning to anticipate that Abel would be the one through which this deliverer would come, and Cain would be the one who opposes him. And so all the anticipation now of Genesis 3 is that mankind, because of the curse, must find a way to overcome the consequences of sin. And so now we're going to get to see how does the one who was identified with God overcome the consequences of sin, and how does the one who was identified with Satan overcome the consequences of sin. And we see the distinction in the ways that each try to overcome the consequences of sin by the offerings that they are about to present. And so in Genesis chapter 4, verse 3, it says this. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Abel, on his part, also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering. But for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. So Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. And so here we see the two different offerings are representative of two different types of faith that each of these men have. It represents the, the two different types of faith and the ways that each of these men were trying to overcome the consequences of sin. And so what we can learn from the offering of Cain, who brought of the fruit of the ground, Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground, and it was a representation of, of Cain overcoming the curse by his own works. God cursed the ground, Abel tilled it, brought forth fruit, and comes and presents to God what he had done. Do you see what I have done? Do you see the works that I have done to overcome the curse? But something was distinctly different about what Abel brought to the Lord. You see, Abel brought firstlings of the flock. But I have a question for you. Why was Abel raising animals? The default answer would probably be to eat them. But we see if we go back to Genesis chapter 1, that God only gave the plants to be for food. It's not until Genesis 9, chapter 3, after the fall, 
that God gives to mankind, animals to also be a source of food for them. And so why did Abel, why was Abel raising animals? It wasn't to eat them. Abel was not raising animals to eat them. We see that it was an act of faith. We see that the reason that Abel was raising animals was an act of faith. And again, we must look again what happened in Genesis chapter 3 to understand that. In Genesis chapter 3, we learn from God's revelation that as God promised a deliverer who would destroy the head of the serpent and who would uh, take away the penalty for sins, that God then slays an animal to provide a covering for the sin of, uh, of mankind. And so we see here that Abel chose to be a keeper of the flocks, not because he was going to eat them, but because of his faith in the person of God, the promise of God, and the provision of God. The distinction that existed between the way that Cain tried to overcome the curse and the way that Abel was seeking to overcome the curse of sin was that Cain had faith in himself and in his own works, whereas Abel had faith in God and in the works of God and in the promise of God to raise up a deliverer. And so we see that in order for deliverance to come, faith in the deliverer is necessary. The first point this morning is that as we look at the progression of sin in this world, the progression of sin in your own life, that faith in the deliverer is necessary for deliverance. Faith in the deliverer is necessary for deliverance. We see this stated clearly in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, which says, as a commentary on this chapter, by faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous, God testifying about his gifts. And through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. Verse 6 adds this on in terms of the necessity of faith. And it says, And without faith it is impossible to please him, God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. So it is by faith that we are delivered and faith in something specifically, faith in God and his promise of a deliverer, that through faith in that promise, the the reward would be forgiveness of sins and restoration back into a relationship with God. But what does this faith mean? If I was to ask you right now, what is faith? What would your definition be? If faith in the deliverer is necessary for deliverance, we better be certain that we have a right definition of faith. And in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, God defines it for us. And he says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things unseen. So what was Abel's faith? Abel's faith, the The assurance of things hoped for was the assurance that God would indeed provide a deliverer, someone who would cover his sins so that he could be brought back into the garden, brought back into the presence of God. You see that faith was faith in the deliverer that is necessary for deliverance. So through this, what do we learn about Cain and Cain's faith? Cain did have faith but it was not in God. Cain's sacrifice was not by faith in God and not according to God's way. Cain's faith was in himself and in his own works, in his own ability to present to God what he had done as a means of trying to restore himself back to God. But only Abel's, whose offering was made by faith in the works of God, was received. Cain, who presented an offering of faith in himself and faith in his own works, was rejected by God. It's interesting that in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, the commentary on this passage, that it says that Abel still speaks. That though Abel is dead, he still speaks. But you know what's interesting? In Genesis chapter 4, Abel never actually speaks. So today, today, 
If Abel is still speaking to me and to you, what is he saying? How does Abel still speak to us today? How Abel still speaks today is that it's necessary to have faith in a deliverer in order for us to experience deliverance. And so my question for you this morning, the first question I have for you is, what is your faith in? In your own personal effort to overcome the penalty and the consequences of sin in your own life, in your effort to overcome the brokenness of the world that we live in, what is your faith in? Is your faith in God and in his promised deliverer, who is Jesus Christ, or is your faith in yourself? Now, I think it's pretty easy for us to deceive ourselves at times and to quickly answer, well, it's faith in God. But in order to help you take a more realistic assessment of where your faith is, I want to ask you a diagnostic question, two of them. And the first question is we use these often around here to help people understand what their faith is truly in. The first question would be this, if today you were to die, if you leave here and are tragically killed in a car wreck on the way home, on a scale of one to 10, one being completely uncertain and 10 being fully certain, how sure are you that you would go to heaven? The way that you answer that question is an indication of where your faith actually rests. The second question would be this, if then you find yourself standing before God and God asks you the question, why should I let you into heaven? What would your answer be? And if your answer begins with I, you've just discovered where your faith really is. I've tried to be good. I've tried hard not to sin. I've tried to help people in this world. I've tried to read my Bible. And you see, if you answer that question in any form with an I, your faith is in yourself and in your works. And in the same way that God had no regard for the offering of Cain's own works, he will have no regard for yours. But if you answer that question by saying, because of the deliverer that you, God, have provided for me, your faith rests in Jesus Christ. And God will have regard for your faith and you will be delivered. So where does your faith rest? It's the first question that we have to ask as we study the story of Cain and Abel. And Abel speaks to us in declaring that faith in the deliverer is required for deliverance. What's interesting to see here is that as Cain is confronted, as as God rejects Cain's offering of the fruit of his own works, as Cain's response is one of anger and is one of sadness and is one of sorrow, and he's upset that God had no regard for all of his effort to bring what he could To God. And in the midst of this, many of you may be in a spot where you're trying really, really hard to overcome your sin. You're trying really, really hard to do good in this world, and you just simply can't believe that God wouldn't have regard for the good that you do. And you're angry at God for whatever reason. But in the midst of God having no regard and rejecting all of Cain's own effort to overcome his sin, we see God's mercy. And the very next thing that we see in the story of Cain and Abel is that God has mercy. God in his mercy gives the opportunity for immediate confession and repentance. And in verse 6, we see this interchange between God and Cain. It says, And the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, 
Sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you, but you must master it. And so we see after Cain shows that he is independent from God and he trusts in his own works, we see God in his mercy give Cain an opportunity to repent. He says, Cain, why are you angry and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? In other words, if you repent, if you quit trusting in yourselves, if you turn from living a life of independence from me and worship me and place your faith in me, then your countenance will be lifted up. Your joy will be restored and you will have life. And the same is true for you today. If you are stuck in your sin and you have lost all of your joy, God is confronting you through Genesis chapter 4. And he's giving you an immediate opportunity for confession and repentance. And if your life is a train wreck, if it is not going well with you, God is declaring to you if you will simply repent, if you will change the place that you are putting your faith in, if you will turn from living a life of independence from God, your countenance will be lifted up and you will be restored. God in his mercy gives you an opportunity for repentance and confession. And apart from that, In the same way that he said to Cain, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you, but you must master it. If you fail to repent, sin will only progress in your life. Sin will only continue to progress in your life if your life is marked by a lack of repentance. If you don't change direction from living independently from God, from putting your faith in yourself, sin will only continue to progress in your life. And it's the exact thing that we see happen to Cain. Cain refuses to repent. And in verse 8, it says this. Cain told Abel his brother, and it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against his brother and killed him. And so we see that instead of responding in the same way that his father Adam did in repenting, Cain chose to continue living in independence from God, living with his faith in himself, and sin began to progress in his life. And the internal anger that he was wrestling with turned to the external expression of anger, of murder. And the same will continue to happen in your life. Because of his lack of repentance, Cain was now being mastered and ruled by sin. How are you doing? When you look at your life and you look at your wandering from God and your lack of faith and trust in him and the progression of sin in your life and as you fail over and over again to turn from it, how is that going for you? Through Christ, do you have rule over the temptations of sin in your life or are you being ruled by your sin? If you fail to repent the sin in your life will only continue to progress and to grow and to consume you. But here's what's amazing about God. In spite of Cain's rejection of his first offer of mercy, God continues to extend mercy. And he gives Cain, in the same way he gives you, another opportunity for confession and repentance. God, in his mercy, gives another opportunity for confession and repentance. And in verse 9, it says this, Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? This should remind us of the question that God asked to Adam back in Genesis chapter 3, Where are you? It's a question of confrontational grace to help, in the same way that it was there to help Adam understand the desperation of his situation. It's a question to Cain to help him understand the desperation of his situation. It's a question to you to help you understand the desperation of your situation. Will you acknowledge that you've wandered from God and will you repent and will you return to him and will Cain? And we see that it says, and Cain said, I do not know where my brother is. Am I my brother's keeper? And with this, we see fully that Cain had committed to the way of his father 
the devil. Satan is known as the father of lies. And here in this statement, we see that Cain states a clear lie. I do not know where my brother is when he knew full well that he had just killed him. And then God said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you cultivate the ground, it will no longer yield its strength to you. You will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. And then Cain here, instead of taking advantage of this opportunity to receive God's mercy, to confess and to repent, instead blames God and wanders further away from him. In verse 13, it says, Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is too great to bear. Behold, you have driven me this day from the face of the ground. And from your face, I will be hidden. And I will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. And whoever finds me will kill me. And so we see the outcome of Cain's commitment to wander in his sin is that he is living with restlessness, hopelessness, wandering from God in a sense of being defeated. Can you relate? Whether it be a little pet sin in your life that you're just tolerating or something that is consuming you, when you are committed to walking in your sin, don't you not feel the same way? Hopeless, restless, separated from God, defeated, And yet even in this, we see that God continues to give mercy and an opportunity of confession and repentance to Cain in the same way that God continually gives you an opportunity by his mercy for confession and repentance. In verse 15, it says, So the Lord told to him, the Lord, so the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. And the, and the Lord appointed a sign for Cain so that no one finding him would slay him. So how is this God's mercy? Because as long as Cain was alive, he would have the opportunity to confess his sin, to change where he placed his faith, and to place his faith in God. And today, right now, no matter where you are in your wandering from God and in your sin, God is giving you an ongoing opportunity by his mercy for confession and repentance. Will you respond with faith in him? Will you repent? Will you change directions and follow God? We'll see that Cain did not make that decision. Cain did not make that decision and there is a sad outcome to his life and it would be the same sad outcome that would occur in any of our lives. And we see that Cain rejects this continual opportunity to respond to God's mercy and instead makes a commitment to live a life wandering from God, independent from him. There's some interesting things here that occur in the next several verses that I want to show you. In verse 16, it says that Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Do you know what Nod means in the original language? It means wandering. So when we think about what the author is communicating to us here, he's saying that Cain's choice of the land of Nod was a statement of his commitment to camp out in his wandering from God. Where are you camping out this morning? Are you camping out in God's presence or are you committed to camping out in your sin? One will lead to life and one will lead to death. And then we see this further commitment of Cain to live a life of independence from God and what the author reveals to us next. In verse 17, it said that Cain had relations with his wife and she conceived and gave birth to Enoch. And he, Cain, built a city and called the name of the city Enoch after the name of his son. Do you know what Enoch means? There's clues hidden all in this passage. The name Enoch means initiation. In the same way that Cain settled in the land of Nod as a commitment of his wandering from God. He then builds a city and names it Initiation. Enoch, Initiation, initiating a new beginning. 
Cain was committed to a new beginning of his life, a new beginning of a life that was committed to living in independence from God. Whereas Adam, his father, chose repentance and was saved by faith in the promised deliverer, Cain is committed to a life of independence from God. He's committed to overcoming the progression of sin and the consequences of the curse by his own works. But what we see is no matter how hard Cain tries to overcome the consequences of the fall in his own life, sin only blooms. In Cain's commitment to live in separation from God and to overcome separation from God by his own works, we see the progression of sin only continue to grow. And it moves not only from consuming Cain, but to, cons- to consuming all of his descendants. And we see that Cain's offspring also live a life that was centered on the advancement of man over the worship of God and faith in him. Verses 18 through 22 say this. Now to Enoch was born Irad, and Irad became the father of Mahujael, and Mahujael became the father of Methushael, and Methushael became the father of Lamech. Lamech took himself two wives. The name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other, Zillah. Ada gave birth to Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubel. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and pipe. As for Zillah, she also gave birth to Tubalcane, the forger of all implements of bronze and iron, and the sister of Tubalcane was Nema. So what do we have listed out for us here? We see a commitment of a people to live a life of independence from God, but who are committed to advancing mankind, to the achievements of mankind. We see the development of music and arts. We see them grow in their ability with agriculture. We see industry and enterprise, but what do we not see throughout this entire passage? Any mention of God. And so we see that although Cain and his descendants have all kinds of achievements in the works of man, what we see is a complete absence of the worship and faith in God. And there's an outcome to that. And the outcome is that despite of the greatest achievements of man, the greatest achievements of man are powerless to stop the progression of sin. No matter how much man does to make a name for himself, sin will continue to grow. Evil will continue to get larger and reap devastating consequences on the culture that that evil is growing in. And so we see then the author pulls out one of Cain's descendants named Lamech, and he holds him up as an example of how the great achievements of man cannot stop the progression of evil and of sin. And it says this in verse 23. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, listen to my voice, you wives of Lamech. Give heed to my speech, for I have killed a man for wounding me and a boy for striking me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, then Lamech 77-fold. And what we see here in the midst of man's achievements is a significant growth of sin and evil in their lives. One of, one of the greatest displays of pride in all of mankind is when someone begins talking about themselves in the third person, all right? And Lamech says, listen to my voice, you wives of Lamech. He's an abundantly arrogant man who has full faith in himself. But then in Lamech, we see not just that he is consumed with pride in the worship of himself, But we see the abandonment of God's good design for marriage when Lamech takes two wives. We see the abandonment of the sanctity of life as Lamech boasts in the murders of multiple men. And we see the abandonment not just of God's good design, but of God himself. And so what we have here as we see sin and faith in oneself and self-worship start in Cain and pass to his descendants is man trying to make a great name for himself And we see a very affluent, rich, wealthy, prospering society, prospering culture in which evil and sin is ravaging it. Is this not the world we live in today? Do we not live in a culture of affluence and of prosperity 
and of the independent spirit and of self-worship and of pride and of the abandonment of not only God's good design but the, the worship and faith in God himself and what is the outcome? We live in a culture today that is ravaging itself with the progression and the spiral of evil and sin. This is the world we live in today. It's why we have to talk about all the things that we did the first six or seven weeks of walking through Genesis, about all the lies of the culture that are tempting us, that are tempting me, that are tempting you to depart from God. The greatest achievements of man, no matter what, the best that this culture has to offer will not slow down the progression of sin and evil in the human heart and therefore in the culture at large. And as we get to this point in the story of Cain and Abel, we see that the one hope that was there of a righteous descendant who was Abel, not the firstborn in Cain, has been killed. And so we should be asking the question at this point in the story, is there any hope? Will God be faithful to keep his promise to raise up a deliverer? And the answer is yes. God is faithful to keep his promise for a deliverer. And that deliverer is not only the hope for the culture that Cain and Abel and Adam and Eve were living in. It's the hope for our culture today. It's the only solution for the root disease of the sin of our culture today. And we see that God is faithful to his promise of a deliverer. In verse 25 It says that Adam had relations with his wife again. And she gave birth to a son and named him Seth. For she said, God has appointed me another offspring in place of Abel. For Cain killed him. To Seth, to him also a son was born. And he called his name Enosh. Then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. And so we see hope. We see hope in God's good design for redemption, in his redemptive plan to raise up a deliverer. We see hope from the mouth of Eve. Eve announces that God continues the hope of a deliverer but by providing Seth as a substitute. Something that's interesting to note, at the beginning of this chapter, when, Cain has, when Eve has Cain, she says that she had gotten She had gotten a man with the help of the Lord. But now here at the end of the chapter, she says fully that God has provided me with another son. And you see that Eve gives all the credit for providing a righteous substitute to God. It's all because of him, by his grace, and by his mercy, that he is faithful to keep his promise. And then we see hope in the promised deliverer from the descendants of Seth. From the descendants of Seth, it says that men began to call upon the name of the Lord again. The descendants of Seth lived by faith in God and in his promise of a deliverer in a culture that had rejected him. Their faith was in God and their focus was to proclaim God and to make his name great. They were not concerned about the advancement of self, but rather the advancement of God. The word call upon could also be translated proclaim. These men were not only set on by faith, drawing near and living in God's presence and independence on him, but they were also set on proclaiming God in his goodness and his mercy and his grace to a culture that had fully rejected him because they knew that through God and God alone could deliverance come. And so we see that God is faithful to keep his promise of raising up a deliverer. And we know that deliverer to be Jesus Christ. And so in summary of all those things, what we see through the story of Cain and Abel is that faith in the deliverer is necessary for deliverance. We see that God in his mercy provides opportunities for confession and repentance. It's never too late for you to turn to God. We saw that the achievement of man will will never stop the progression of sin. And we see that God is faithful to his promise of a deliverer. And so the question then is, how do we respond to this truth? How should you leave here and respond to the truths that are declared 
in the story of Cain and Abel. And for the unbeliever in the room, someone who has rejected God up to this point, how you respond to it is to understand that his mercy is more. And that God is giving you an immediate opportunity to respond to his grace and no longer live by faith in yourself, but by faith in him and in his son, Jesus Christ, who alone can set you free from the dominion of Satan and the power of sin in your life. That is how you respond to the truth of Genesis chapter 4 and not experience the progression and growth of sin and evil in your own life. Then there's another group in the room this morning which would be the religious unbeliever. And you may say, what is that? Did you know that Cain, did you recognize and observe that Cain and and Abel were both religious? Cain and Abel both brought offerings to the Lord. They both went through some motions of religion, but only one had a faith that would save. See, there may be some of you in this room who maybe have been attending church services your entire life. But at the end of the day, your faith has not been in God, but in yourself and in your good deeds and in your works. And you would be a religious unbeliever. And the response for you this morning would be the same as that as an outright unbeliever. To acknowledge and to recognize this morning that God is giving you an immediate opportunity to repent. And to no longer have faith in yourself, but faith in God and his deliverer who alone can set you free. Will you trust him? Will you place your faith in Jesus Christ this morning and be set free? And then the last group, the largest group in the room this morning would be for those of us who believe. Who have placed our faith in the promised deliverer of Jesus Christ to set us free from the rule of Satan and the penalty of sin in our life. How should we respond to the truths that are proclaimed. And how we respond is to live like righteous Abel, to live like the descendants of Seth, and to call upon the name of the Lord, and to proclaim the name of the Lord. Because the culture, the people that are trapped in a culture of lies that we are seeing progress further and further and further and further into sin, there is only one hope for them that people who call upon the name of the Lord would proclaim his name, who would hold up that his mercy is more, and who would invite them to repent and to place their faith in Christ. And in doing so, we can offer the only thing to the culture around us that could truly set them free. Yes, we should continue in all the ways that are righteous and just and faithful to treat the symptoms of a culture that have rejected God, but we can't do that while removing the only thing that can truly set people free, which is the proclamation of the gospel that God has provided to the deliverer. It is the primary focus of our life as we call upon God's name that we would proclaim his name. For faith in the deliverer is the world's only hope for deliverance. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and for your mercy. We thank you for the clarity that you give us in your word to understand the world in which we live today. God, we thank you that your mercy is indeed more and that, yes, you stand in judgment, that, yes, there is a penalty for sin, and in the midst of all that, what shines brightly is your grace and your mercy and that you extend it freely to us. So God, I pray this morning that you would move those here who are far from you to repent and to respond to your offer of mercy and grace and to place their faith in Jesus Christ. And for those of us who are covered by the blood of the lamb who was slain because of our faith in him, that we would not forsake the ability that we have the blessing, the ultimate prize of our salvation, of drawing near to you, of communing with you, that we would not forsake that for the fleeting pleasure of sin that this world has to offer that will only ultimately lead to destruction in our lives today. God, may you help us to remind ourselves of the gospel daily, that we would understand that 
by it, not only are we saved, but it is how we live. And in doing so, that we would be a people who overflow with songs of worship. That daily we would call upon your name and live in your presence. And that we would be people who proclaim the goodness and mercy of our God. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen.